All right. Hello, beautiful light filled souls. I am here with a near death experiencer, Sherry Ame, and I am so excited to hear her story and talk a little bit more about her near death experience, which is a profound one. And I, in my interview style, I don't like to spend too much time on the physical, but we kind of have to because you were dead for 90 minutes or they were working on you I read for close to 90 minutes which is an extensive amount of time so I'm really wondering what you learned in the afterlife and what what you experienced outside form but if you wouldn't mind just telling me some of the background about your near-death experience and then kind of jumping into that and then later we'll get to your career because that's really interesting too <laughs> <laughs> okay great um, so hi everyone again my name is Sherry Ame and um, thank you so much for having me on the show it's really it's an honor for me to be able to um, not only share my story but to share my story even with those the others that have had a near-death experience because I'm sure you understand there's a lot of um, hesitation, I think, for many of us in coming out with our stories. And uh, one, of my, um, one of my hopes is to really share it uh, for the near-death experience community as well so that um, all of you understand that what you, you, what you experienced was, was real. It was real for us. And that's all that matters at the end of the day. Um, so I just really wanted to point that out because I know it's difficult. It's been difficult for me to share my story, um, but I've shared it enough now where I'm comfortable and I feel like at least I can kind of open the doorway. Yeah, and a lot right? of people wait 20 years. For me, it was like 15 years when I publicly started talking on I Survived and the Nat Geo, but yeah. But I told it to close friends and to some family members who didn't accept it very well and then to my students. And they they were the most receptive, the young ones who were yeah. open in that way. So you're coming out pretty quickly. Is it what, five years or so? Um, it's actually it's been uh seven years now seven exactly. Years. Wow. Um but I've been sharing it pretty publicly now for three years. So, uh, so that would make it, you know, about four years after was really when I started. What really when I said, you know what, forget it, forget what everybody else thinks. I'm going to share my story because I know there's a message message in there. Oh so, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and I'm just amazed by the whole thing. So I guess we have to start somewhere. So, yeah. What, what brought you into the hospital and how did you end up in that 90 minutes of, of yeah. intense revival? Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, it started because I had, uh, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma um, and it was right after I got married, literally two months after. Wow. Um, and I went through six months of chemotherapy and I was actually cancer free. So I was doing fantastic. I was um, getting back to my health. And about eight months after I had finished that last chemotherapy, which was on my birthday, um, I actually suffered cardiac arrest. Mm. And I thankfully was already in the emergency room. Um, but what's very interesting about my story is pretty much the three weeks leading up to the cardiac arrest. So I'll just briefly go into that. Um, I, Like I said, I had been recovering from uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was cancer free and uh, really was creating this new life, this new beginning again, you know, taking the lessons from what I had just learned from facing my death, you know, once. Um, and I really had this whole new perspective on life and really what I wanted to do with it. And um, it was three weeks prior to the cardiac arrest that I was not feeling well at all. There was something internally that I felt was like, okay, maybe it's pneumonia. You know, it definitely felt like it was coming from inside me, but it wasn't a cold. It was just a level of uncom uncomfortness, you know, that was just could not put words to it. It sounds like it was heavy. Yes, yeah. yes. It was definitely, it was heavy and it was like deep within. Huh. And um, and I thought, okay, maybe it'll go away, you know. And it didn't. And when I started to really get scared, I went and uh, went to the emergency room. And I said that I was having trouble breathing and something just didn't really feel right. And, 
it, some things were dropped basically and I didn't really have a full workup and um, what happened was they sent me home and that feeling inside me started getting worse and the only way I can describe this is not only did I have this physical symptom but I kept having this voice say to me like in a calm way that um, this is it this is actually it and I knew for the last I would say two weeks that um, I this was it this was the end so yeah and it wasn't until I think that last week when I had really been trying to go see different doctors I had been trying to um, get emergency help and no one really was believing me because I looked fine I looked absolutely fine and uh, lo and behold um, I was at the beach probably two days prior and I was sitting there because I thought maybe it was stress and I'm laying out on this gorgeous beach and this voice said to me after about an hour to get up and go home and right before you drive home I want you to call your husband and tell him what road you're taking home and where you are that you're leaving the uh, beach because I was about an hour away and just tell him exactly which road you're taking home and it was a very strong voice and I didn't I didn't question it um, so I did that I happened to make it home and so I kind of was like all right maybe that was just me being weird and it was the next day that I had gone to see my meditation teacher and I went to see her and at the minute I walked into her office which was like my safe haven because I knew her and I said to her nobody believes me but something's seriously wrong and I burst into tears and it was like this wailing from the depths of my soul this long deep soul wailing and in that moment it was like the truth of all existence came flooding through my system and I felt connected to the, just the angels in the room and I kept saying to her over and over again bawling my eyes out I kept saying I made a mistake I made a mistake and she said what did you make a mistake about I said I did everything wrong everything from how I ate from how I did this I was too busy living my life listening to other people and they don't even know anything who knows anything anyway and I just kept blurting out these things that just made no sense you know it, it just makes sense to me as you're saying right? <laughs> it makes sense now, right? but it was crazy wow. and I just kept screaming and crying at the top of my lungs because the truth just hit me smack in the face and in that moment I realized it was too late hmm. it was too late. so when did you end up going into the hospital how did that so I ended up driving home that night and I told my husband once again which road I was taking I, for whatever reason, I stopped to pick him up his favorite Thai food, <laughs> knowing I did not feel well, knowing that this was it. And I, I can't justify my train of thinking. I just wanted him to be, I wanted to clean up everything. I wanted mm -hmm. to leave everything in a good spot. And I drove home, I put his food uh, out on the table and I said I'm not feeling well I'm gonna go to lay down and he came in the bed later that night and he said um, and I said to him promise me that should anything happen to me that you will take care of my beagle it was my little best friend and uh, he said you already know that I've told you that before I said no I need you to tell me again and he said, I promise I'll take care of Snoopy. And I said, thank you. And I was so relieved. And I went to bed that night crying my eyeballs out. And that's the last I remember before I died. Wow. So you were rushed to the hospital. And then what did you experience when you had your, your death experience? Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, I don't remember anything from the day I died because it was the next day. Um, but I do remember instantly dying. I do remember uh, instantly going from the physical world and all of a sudden finding myself in this white light where I felt light as a feather. I felt um, free. You know, free is the biggest word I can say. It was like yes. the burdens had just yeah. lifted. <laughs> like we're supported, but free at the same yeah. time. And all that this body and all that the physical encases us in, it restricts us from that freedom. So that's a very important word. It is just free, free of yeah. worry, free of pain, free of everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it was it. I felt I had been free from everything that I had been through, the cancer, the feeling like a burden on people's lives because I had been sick. Yeah. So there was a lot of freedom of that, that shame that so many of us carry every mm -hmm. single day for whatever reason. You know, we, we feel shameful for sometimes how we look or, or maybe we don't have a good enough job or maybe we don't make enough money. There's this, there's this level of constant shame. Yeah, it's either shame or judgment, you know, yeah. and then you're free of both of those in that environment. And it's just yeah. love, at least, yeah. at least for me, I, I just felt freedom and love. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I felt. And, you know, sometimes people say to me, well, when you when you crossed over and you found yourself like in just nothingness and whiteness, <laughs> they're like, were you scared? And I'm like, no, because it was just filled with love. Yeah, I it's understand. Just love. Yeah, and I and I felt safe, so I never once ever felt scared um, from the moment I crossed over, and um, I was shortly after greeted by uh, these beings. I call them, and uh, I actually refer to them as like my, my welcoming committee. <laughs> I love uh, that. <laughs> yeah, and they they really were. <laughs> And mine were just two, but they were extremely large. Were yours large and intelligent? And yes, what yes. were they like to they you? Were, they were definitely, uh, they felt like higher beings. Yes. Uh, like a higher, definitely a higher um, intelligence. Um, for me, there was um, like, I always say six to nine because it's hard for me to tell, but I was actually encased by them in a circle. Oh. And um, yeah, and we ended up, uh, I ended up with them at some point after the white light. I ended up with them at the bottom of the ocean. Um, yeah, which was very interesting and it was very peaceful. I felt safe, but they were, they circled me at the bottom of the ocean. I was in the middle, just floating there. And I remember at, at one point saying, I know where I am. I know I died and I feel so free. Like, I know what it's like now to die. Um, I, I, I just feel connected to everything. I know my family is okay. That was my biggest fear ever of dying was leaving the people that I loved behind. And I had just experienced it. And I was like, I feel nothing but love and, and that my family is safe and that there is all the worries that we have in the world are, are, are so false. And, and we don't know that because we're living in such a dense physical world. But when I was on that other side, I, I knew it as a fact. Yes. And so, so there wasn't that worry that so many of us have, like, oh, my God, you know, when I pass away, we're going to worry about, you know, our family. There wasn't that worry because you know no matter what that everything is always okay. They're going to end up where you ended up and where I ended up, and it's all going to be fine. <laughs> and that's yes. there's peace in that. There's a lot of peace. Do you feel like your angels were sending you a lot of messages all at one time? Have you unpacked it over time, some of the messages? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I generally, uh, so much happened to me in, in the afterlife, like so much that. I have told the whole thing once before, and it was actually eight hours long. Wow. And so, you know, there's a lot of messages that came in. A lot of things started to make sense even years after. Um, because really, you know, after that initial greeting, 
I I had said to them I didn't want to I didn't want to come back. I I was I loved where I was and I was ready to move on. And they gave me the time to think about it. Mm-hmm. And during that time I had a very very long life review, but it turned out that it wasn't just of one lifetime, it was of multiple lifetimes. So I got to experience um, many different dimensions, many lifetimes, many versions of my core soul uh, themes played out in different roles, different circumstances, different timelines. um, And I got to see how they all connected. Was that very healing for you? It had to be. I mean, to yeah. see it all play out and to go, okay, was this in one life and then this in another. I so, mean, did you feel at the end just like greater acceptance of, of everything? Yeah. I, at the end, it was like, I got it. Like, I was shown the whole of how life works. And I, I changed my decision. And the reason I decided to come back was because now that I knew how every dimension, lifetime, whatever you want to call it, now that I know how everything was connected and interconnected and how the certain people were uh, ending up in my life at different lifetimes and this, because I knew now how it worked, I wanted to actually go back into the existing lifetime where I had just come from and redo everything all over again, knowing what I know. And what did you want to change most of all? So what was that? Did you have a certain mission or a certain will when you came yeah, to it change was something? Pretty, yeah, it was definitely to address um, the core issue that had been that I had seen that had followed me from lifetime to lifetime. So whether I was an animal, whether I was a human, whether I was living in the United States, whether I was living in Japan or India, there still was a sa- uh, the, the same soul theme that was running throughout each of them. And I knew that if I could clear and solely address that one area, that I would not have to carry that with me to the other lifetimes. How interesting. So I've talked a little bit about this in past videos, but I feel like I've recently, the past couple of years, stepped into a place beyond some of my past lifetimes where I'm Mm -hmm. finally speaking and I'm finally, you know, owning some of my deeper truths. Do you feel like you're operating in this place that is beyond the other Mm -hmm. lifetimes where it's just like new and you're looking around going, okay, (laughs) this is new. (laughs) Yeah, it's um, for me, you know, this always sounds weird, but For me, being back here, because I've experienced all the dimensions, um, I'm always living and experiencing them at all times. But uh, I've been able to, over the years, focus in on, like, this physical reality. (laughs) And, you know, and it takes some time when you first get back. You have no no idea which dimension you're in. Uh, I remember being afraid to close my eyes at night because I didn't know which dimension I would wake up into. So it took a long time to trust again that, okay, I was back in this core reality, but I did not need to fear the other realities because that was how I was going to utilize um, my, my newfound superpowers to create heaven on earth here utilizing now what I know of how everything is interconnected. So for me, everything is energy, meaning um, uh, not just how happy you are, but how I, how I actually see the world is energetic vibration. So I'm less focused on, okay, I need this job and I need to get this blah, 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 and I need to make this amount of money. And I'm more focused on what frequency do I need to be around to move this like mountain over here and mm. it's it's a very different way of approaching life interesting uh, yeah because yeah. It, it what it does is it allows you to focus less on the micro more on the macro energetic levels and then allow the universe to fill in the gaps after you have already set the tone for what vibration you are reaching for 
I, I know what you're talking about. That like makes this sense. may be silly. I, I made an Instagram post that for the past month I've woken up and I've danced like to really happy, high vibration music. And I'm like, that's my future. That's the future I'm walking into. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's exactly it. That's exactly yeah. it. And, and honestly, like that's the best way to describe how I live my life and how I've been able to rebuild my life so quickly, especially with business. It's only taken me three years to accomplish all the things I've accomplished. And that was literally on the heels of a heart transplant. Wow. So, wow. you know, it, the, the only reason I, the only reason I've been able to accomplish what I've accomplished is when everybody talks about law of attraction, the mistake they make is by being so focused with words on what it is they want, that they're in this constant disappointment of what they haven't gotten yet. Whereas when you were dancing, right? When you're dancing, you're creating how you want to feel in the future. Right. And the, th and the thing is, if you know how you want to feel, then obviously everything that comes into your life will support that. And it's your, it's your job to accept the high vibrations that are coming in. And for me, like for example, you know, sometimes people are like, how did I end up in blockchain technology? You know, and the, the thing is, all I did was put out this energy. That's all I did. I thought I was gonna be going one way. And the universe all of a sudden brought me this whole other group of people, this <laughs> whole other company, this whole other industry that I did not even understand yet. Like it was a totally new industry that I did not understand. But I said to myself, this is not a look at the signs. I said, there is a reason that all this is happening. It's all good stuff, even though I have no idea what it is. And so instead of saying, but my journal says that I'm supposed to <laughs> write the book, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do that, right? That's what we do every day. Right. So I said, let me just follow the vibration because obviously the universe is shoving this in my face and I am happy and giddy as can be every single day and I'm shoving it down because it doesn't match what's in my journal. This is a little bit off topic, but what do you do when you find that people don't like your high vibration energy or they try to bring you down? Or have you experienced some of that where you've had to leave people behind who yes. just didn't like where you're going? And that's kind of because I've experienced that. And it's kind of a painful experience yeah. because you want to bring people up not to have to say goodbye. Yes, and, and I know how painful that is. Um, and for somebody that is like, literally like a recovering people pleaser, <laughs> um, I trust me, I get it. And the way I was able to come, uh, move through that was everybody has a choice in life, everybody. And when you realize, like nobody, nobody was on that life support table with me, nobody. Nobody was there. I alone had to come up with the inner fight of my life to pull through. Because you know what? There were other patients in that uh, ICU alongside me that gave up. I mean, everybody kept saying to me, like, they can't believe I did not give up. If you saw the patients next to you that were less worse than you that gave up and did not survive. And that's when I knew it really is a choice and all of us have tough things in life all of us but nobody can make that choice for you and after my whole tragedy after the transplant after the near death experience i said to myself we all have that cho that is our that is our power that is our biggest power is the power of choice in this physical world and yes. you choose your vibration. So now when somebody is around me and they are not matching that level of vibration, they don't belong in, in this dimension that I am sitting. <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. That's perfect. Yeah. It really, yeah. You're creating 
this yeah. reality. And so if they don't want to be in it, then they just don't yeah. get to be in it. That's their yeah. choice. And it yeah. does it does not work to have them both. You cannot have an open heart and so much love and light and so much judgment and shame in the same like cells in the same cellular makeup it doesn't exist so how can you thrive in life how can i take care of my health how can you thrive and attract the people the 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 health the wellness the the finances how can you attract that if you've got some bad cells in there that you have not taken your strength and said no Beautifully yeah. said. Yes. Oh, amen. That's yeah. just awesome. So one thing, one thing that I loved that you said on the Total Freedom podcast was that people's idea of heaven and hell is very mistaken, that it's not exactly what you think it are. it is at all, that when you don't follow your heart and your passion and you choose not to do that, that that is hell and that creates a hell within you. And could you elaborate some more on that topic? Because I think that was just so beautifully said, what you said on that program. Yeah, I mean, I get this all the time, you know, is there heaven and hell? And the truth is, is that um, what I experienced was the hell was what comes from the inside of us. It's actually something we create ourselves. It is that level of shame, that level of disgust that we have for ourselves, our decisions that we've made. And it's these decisions that we've made because we're following somebody else's rules of how to live our soul's mission on this planet. And it is when you can free yourself to no longer live according to somebody else's guidelines. You know, the way your parents absolutely say, you've got to go to law school and you don't want to go to law school. Your being is so much bigger than, you know, grade school up to college, up to, we're so, we're powerful cosmic beings. And when you live your life constantly uh, playing somebody else's game of life, you are creating your own hell, your own living, conscious breathing quarters of regret that is where hell is it comes from this deep level of regret that is built up over years and years and years and years up to the day the moment that you are about to pass away and like i said in the beginning how i had that flood of regrets and the depths of my soul was wailing that said. that is why it is so imperative to live your life true to your heart and to be strong enough to stand up for yourself and what it is you are looking to create because we are all specks of stardust. We are no different from the specks on the moon, the stars out in the skies. It, we're all stardust. So you've, you've got to, you have got to expand the way your soul makeup is, is meant to, just like an exploding star. You know, these stars grow and they grow and they grow until all of a sudden they explode. We are no different. And I think once I'm able, once I was able to really see myself as that, I was able to put up all the boundaries that I needed, not shutting my heart down, but just vibrational wise, I hear you when you say that, but my role is to be open with love and to follow my heart and to follow my dreams. But I appreciate you. And if we don't vibe, if you're not okay with that, I'm going to still go this way because everything that I am creating is being drawn to me. Interesting. And the way I relate to this is I heard this statement in my near-death experience, be like a little child. And as a little child, our hearts are open and we love animals and we love nature and we love everyone. We even love parents who are abusive or who, you know, we just love. Yes. And that kind of open-heartedness is a beautiful thing to experience and a beautiful way to interact in the world. And it allows for so much more fun. You know, when I'm in that space, 
Yeah. I'm playing in nature. I'm waking up dancing. <laughs> I'm loving my friends. I'm loving my life. I love yeah. my student. You know, that that kind of energy is so much fun to be a part of. Yes. The way you put it, though, it makes so much more sense from the adult perspective. It's like, yeah, you do have to have some boundaries in order to stay that open hearted and that pure of and in that in that place. And that makes a ton of sense. Yes. So another thing that you said that just struck me is like many philosophers say that the mind creates a heaven of hell or a, a hell of heaven and yet you say it's the heart and that makes a little bit more sense to me that you know the heart is so beautiful and it simply wants to love and love is all that matters that's what i heard on the other side love is all that matters and yeah, so absolutely if yeah. you want to yeah, and 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 just so people understand, like, you know, like I said, I really was a massive people pleaser, and the difference I had to learn was you can't really say you're a kind person if you're not kind to yourself. You know, I think a lot of us miss that, um, because how can that how can that possibly be true kindness? If you're not even, you can't love something else unless you love yourself. And I think that's such a hard thing to realize. And you can't you know? teach that to someone too. Like you can try to yeah. love someone who doesn't love themselves and you can't teach them how to love themselves. That's an inside job. It is. It's absolutely an inside job. And, um, you know, I, I, my criteria now, and this was the complete opposite. I mean, what I mean after I came back from my whole journey and heart transplant, everything I've been through for seven years recovering, I would say the majority of my friends I had to leave behind. Um, that was the most like painful thing ever, all right? But what shortly replaced after that has been miracle after miracle after miracle. And I always stress to people now, and I try to be like a walking example. I'm not the type to really go around like preaching about like heaven or like preaching about this is right or this is wrong because I don't think anything is black and white either. But I try to walk as the example. I try to be in my high vibrational state and who honestly, I don't see I don't see the people that can't stand it. What usually happens is they just fall away. And then I'm like, oh, where'd that person go? <laughs> so it, it's, but that's because I'm so strong in it. And people feel that confidence. Like, no one's really going to come to my face and question it. Interesting. Yeah. And yeah. I read, I think maybe it was on your blog somewhere, about how you were talking about now you have no rules, no boundaries. You're not going to limit yourself in any way. And people try to limit us the world tries to limit us we in our own minds say oh maybe that's possible maybe it's not could you explain a little bit more about this no limit and no boundaries to money to life to career to anything yeah yeah um that's a good way to explain that because i know it's <laughs> such a hard concept um yeah it's something like I, it just i naturally live it now and i think I'm trying to think of what the beginning, I think, I really honestly think the beginning stages were learning to set those boundaries. So, for example, uh, the people in my life, I really, uh, the first step, I had to make a commitment. It was like, I'm going to figure out how the, the heck to love myself, how to appreciate who I am right now. After this transplant, I was in a wheelchair at the time. And how can I truly forgive myself for everything that I am not? Everything that I'm not. And I think often we don't really attack forgiveness like that. We think of forgiveness as when somebody does something to us and, oh, now we need to forgive the situation. Right? I, when I came back from the afterlife, I knew that that judgment day was I needed to forgive myself for all those things that came up during the regret phase. I just happened to live and tell about it. Most people pass on, right? Yeah. But I actually live through the regrets of the dying and am now back 
to do it again. So what am I going to do differently? I'm going to forgive myself from all for all those ways that I allowed my power to be taken from me by somebody else saying I needed to be in this job or somebody not agreeing with me being happy all the time. I had that my whole life. The minute I was happy, I was in trouble. Mm. So what it meant was now that I am back, how do I shift that? Unfortunately, it means no matter who you are, if you're blood or not, if you cannot physically be happy for me when I'm happy, you do not belong in my life, period. And it starts with being able to treat yourself with so much love and so much kindness that you start to see your heart as this ball of golden light, this ball of golden energy. And I say to people now, and they see it now because they've seen me do this for three years, I say I only surround myself by people who treat my heart like gold. Hmm. Perfect. And how many of us can honestly say that? I could not in my old life. I could not tell you that every day I was surrounded by people that treated my heart like gold because half the time I was crying. Mm. Half the time I was crying because people were not treating me well. That is, that is said in such a powerful and profound way. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to switch to talking a little bit about your career and what you're doing. And as it fascinates me, a couple of <laughs> months ago, I connected with a woman who is in marketing and part of her desire to be in marketing is to help spiritual people. And I knew nothing about this. You know, I'm just making yeah. a few YouTube videos. I'm a professor, you know, and I was that, like, okay, whatever. This is just for fun. But that, I did get this message from God that said, you're done with your teaching message, your, you know, mission, you can do whatever you want now. And so mind blown, like right. you know, whatever yeah. I want, what does that mean? So I'm continuing to teach as I figure it out and think about it. But her mission really is to help people get their message out there and to market themselves. And I'd like to hear more about your ideas behind brand influencing and, and how you help people in, in that way. Yeah, so the brand, the, a lot of the brand influence was um, how I actually rebuilt my life. So uh, like I said, uh, after you know the seven years of really recovering, uh, it really ended up with a heart transplant uh, three years ago. And it was that point where I came home where I was like, well, what am I going to do for work? You know, I'm still recovering. Um, I can't, I'm not very mobile. And I, so I started by actually just sharing my story of my near death experience online. And I told it so much. And I was so, you know, when people hear me share my story, you know, they don't, I share it with such like conviction. Like, I mean, I can see it in my head. So, um, I, I thankfully got enough of a following of people being like, wow, you know, and I would always have different stories to share because the story was so um, big. And through that, I, I learned to find my own voice and I learned how to build community. I learned how to build influence because my story started landing me interviews and speaking events eventually. And, um, and so people started asking me, how did you do that? And I said, really, um, I just, you know, I used to be in branding for Fortune 500 companies and pro more product branding. And I just decided, you know, what if I was the product? What if my heart was the product? And that's what I did. I just branded myself as my heart and taught people how to stand out above the noise. You know, there's so many uh, people, entrepreneurs, businesses, um, other, you know, spiritual uh, people sharing similar messages. How do you make yourself stand out? And how do you connect to the right audience? Like, I've yes. always thought that my audience is the Me Too movement, you know, and, and women who have survived a lot. And sometimes I get confused on, well, how do I reach them? You know, yeah. like that demographic. Do you have advice yeah. for specific things like that? Yeah, you know, it, my advice 
uh, again, it, it is somewhat different from other branding um, experts, but uh, I will say uh, I come from literally over 15 years experience in branding. So there's a lot of all already natural stuff in me that I just know the psychology of marketing and branding already. Uh, it's just in your blood when you've been in it for so long. Really all I did was attach the truth, transparency, authenticity to it. That's all I did and mm -hmm. and and made myself uh, the product. And I was able to duplicate that to other other you know uh, entrepreneurs or uh, or people that had businesses. And the biggest thing really is um, allowing your tribe to find you. So sometimes, and I have found this, that um, and it's it's basically why I'm in the fields I'm in. I'm in the fields I'm in because I naturally attract a certain type of audience. For example, I can talk about spirituality to um, blue in the face, blue in the face. There is no way I could ever create an online tribe that was solely a spiritual community. Uh, because it's the motivation that people are way more attracted to the practical I, hip tips well, about it, life or I, I think it's it's just who you are. Your oh. your tribe is more just going to find you based on who you are. So if the thing is with me, if you hang out with me long enough, you'll know that half the time I, I can talk about heaven. The next time I'm like fascinated by technology and what will happen is I will lose all the people that are thinking about the spiritual. They're like, what is she talking about technology? <laughs> because, because I'm just being me. Interesting. Interesting. And so what I had to do is I had to come to, I had, I, cause I used to think, uh, I was like, why can't I do this? Like I've got this near death story. Why can't I be like other uh, spiritual, you know, people out there that are creating these, you know, YouTube communities that I couldn't like, I'm telling you, I've tried so many times <laughs> and I can't. And it's, it's, I realize it's just because of who I am. I am a very, yeah, I have a very eclectic personality. So I had to find what was it. And this was my three year process with my brand. I had to figure out what was unique about the people that are drawn to me. And what I realize what it is, is I draw less of um, the core tribe, right? So like, let's say it was like the Me Too movement, or if it was just women or the, I, I attract less of that, but more the leaders that are communicating to those tribes. Interesting. Yeah, I can see that. Right. So for example, like I attracted you and you've got your community. Yes, yes. Right. So I think what helps is knowing actually what your role is and instead of beating yourself up for it, accepting it, right? Yeah. There's, there's that forgiveness piece. There's more that. fun in accepting <laughs> it and just going, yeah, I'm going to be me. Right, <laughs> and maybe exactly. someday I'll be teaching a class out in nature and we're dancing around and that's just what right. I'm going to do and I'm going to find some people right. who will join me. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so I really think like, like, for example, with you, like if there was – um, you know, a me to crowd that you're looking to create, you can definitely do the steps, but if it's not coming, yeah. it's, it's because it, you will, you will connect with them in a different way. Yeah. And maybe, you know, as you're saying that, um, my real message is about healing is a shift and it's a quick shift from all of that. So maybe it doesn't have to be just that issue. It can be anything exactly. you know, emotional, anything that's traumatizing on yeah. any level, physical, spiritual, mental, that when we connect to that divine, when we connect to our angels, we're just in this flow of complete healing. The way that the near death experience shows us, we can be free outside of form, but we can be free in form too. Exactly. And Yes. <laughs> like, yes, exactly. So it's so powerful when you truly like live from that place. Yes, it is. So yeah. tell me more about what you're doing, you know, like yeah. with, with your um, brand and with your, uh, yeah. your ventures. Yeah. So, um, so like I said, I did the branding thing for a while and I myself had that little calling that you did um, a little while ago. And it was that I had reached the point where um, 
what I was doing and the projects that I was going to be involved with were taking a new form. Mm. And it, I was getting, uh, I would say I was getting messages for, gosh, a year that I needed, because I had a whole branding academy and everything that I was just needing to close that down, that it had served its purpose. But now I had recovered a lot of my body. I had, re I had healed a lot. I had found this powerful new voice. I had found leadership in me that I never had before. And it was time to go bigger. It was time to expand bigger. And I didn't know what that looked like. So there was this period, probably about six months to six to eight months, of breathing through the fear wow. because I did I knew something bigger was coming and I didn't know what it was and where it ended up landing me was right back where I started so I started my career before I died in the tech world and somehow I have landed right back in it um, now with the new technology that's called blockchain and um, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, you may have heard that term, but um, it's a whole other field. But what's great about it is that I've built this brand based on the heart. Mm -hmm. And I was hired not just because of my skills, but because my heart and my ability to create community. And my role now is creating community within this new technology space. And I'm able to bring my light, my love, my meditations, my um, just healing energy to people in an industry that normally would not have this in it. <laughs> I can see that. That's awesome, right? though. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm telling you, when, the, when I got the job, everything clicked. I said... I had my near-death experience, I had this whole awakening, the tribe that I was, you know, kind of struggling with, uh, struggling with, uh, you know, why am I only attracting leaders, like really high up leaders, but I couldn't, I couldn't attract the daily everyday people that I felt like really needed my message. And then I realized it's because that is one of my missions when I was in heaven was that I was actually going to be working with literally top leaders, top leaders around the world. And that that is where my, uh, my powers needed to be. That makes a lot of sense because people who are trying to help other people get depleted, they forget how to replenish themselves, how to set boundaries. You know, I, I can let myself be pulled in a mil million directions because this person is hurting around the world and this person is asking me questions. And yeah, yeah I mean, we need to be reminded of how to do this, you know, how to yes. help people. And so, yeah, your, your skills are needed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, and that was something, again, that came to me the last three years. And again, I came from accepting what is and not trying to force it. <laughs> not, but that's how I stepped into and I opened up this whole new doorway of financial abundance. I mean, connecting with people I never in my life would have thought uh, they would ever see me. Mm. Um, you know, just being able to know that I can take care of, you know, my, my heart transplant medicines and, and just so many things. I'm traveling now. I mean, I'm, I'm going to uh, London in, what, two weeks? And this was all, uh, you know, I've been to L.A. like three times in the past um, couple months. I mean, it's literally all because I just let go. And I allowed my vibration to just stay where it was, even though I didn't know where it was taking me, like you're dancing. <laughs> Wonderful. And yeah. do you still feel connected to angels and guidance? Do you feel that that veil is pretty thin in your daily life? Yes. Every single day, it's, it's a connection. Um, 
I still, it's very easy for me to connect. I still, I, I love this moment right now that I'm in because I'm so deep in technology right now that this is the big test. <laughs> like, can, <laughs> can I still live heaven on earth in the midst of like managing, funny. you know, 10 different people? And, um, but yes, I can. And, and it's because I bring it with me wherever I am. And I'm always still saying, and reminding myself, Sherry, you are hired for exactly who you are. So just because you're in this position doesn't mean you need to stop being your light. Mm, very and nice. be the light and allow everybody else's vibration to rise up to yours because you are a walking change maker on this planet. You experience something that not many others have. It is now in your hands to be that light and to mm. not let anybody else stop you. And before we end, I do want to give you some time to talk about your workshop in Austin because Pat Johnson reached out to me to interview those who are coming to Austin. And so I'm going to take your workshop. So if you would give yeah. a little preview, then uh, maybe yeah. more people will sign up because I think it's yeah. going to be awesome. Yes, I'm so excited for um, this event. I'll be doing um, one of the keynote speech, uh, speeches, and then I'll be giving a workshop with a good friend of mine, Tanaz Chubb, and uh, she is actually the creator of foreverconscious.com, uh, which is an incredible site if you have not seen it. And um, we're just going to be doing a, a workshop called How to Create Heaven on Earth. So it's a lot of what I've just been talking about today, only I really wanted to give um, a, a safe space and create a safe space where I can give you that experience of what heaven on earth actually feels like. And then with Tanaz Chubb and, and all of the work that she does, we're going to combine forces so she can join in with those practical everyday t um, tasks, assignments, w rituals, whatever you want to call them, that I do naturally at this point that I don't really even think about. But she's so great at actually putting <laughs> together these, these amazing rituals and things that you do every day that it was just a perfect partnership for both of us. So we really want to give you that experience. Again, it's based on my near-death experience and what I've learned, um, partnered with Tanaz, and we're just going to give you that experience of how to create heaven on earth so you can take that with you out in the world and, and really um, be able to stand in your power. You know, a lot of this is all about that power. And for those of us that have had our near-death experiences, you know the power that I'm talking about. And it's real. And I don't care how many years have gone by, we still have that. Yes. And yep. as you're... As you're talking about that, I understand exactly what you mean about some things just come so natural to us that we don't even have names for them. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I talked to ancestors for years after my near-death experience, and then people were like, oh, that's mediumship. I was like, right. oh, <laughs> we'll <laughs> just talk to them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's right. That's exactly why I have to nods with me. Yes. Because I, I told her the same thing. I'm like, I do things, but then when I read her stuff, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> Isn't that great? So we need people with that spiritual language to translate for us, I think, at times, yeah. because we're given just a lot of knowledge on that other side, and then we bring it back, and, you know, we're using it. You seem to have done really well with assimilating all of that knowledge really quickly. Did you reach out to a lot of people like Tanaz, or did you just have a way of just embracing it? I think uh, there's a couple things. Before my near-death experience, I actually had just started practicing meditation. I was very new to all of it. I was like, what's meditation? Like, it's so fun. <laughs> I was like, I sit still. Like, am I doing this right? You know, like, so very beginner. But I think when I had my near-death experience, it opened up everything, and I was already so open. Plus... I still now had seven years removed from the world because I had the physical yes. issues still going on. So yeah. I actually had seven years of 
literally quiet, like removed from the world. And I think a lot of that time, I forget how much soul work I did mm -hmm. at that time. I really, I, I get you know, that. Yeah. yeah, because I had a year in a body cast, you know, mostly in a room and, and yes. I did that deep meditation and that deep healing and facing things and manifesting yes. that, you know, like from my bed, I manifested exactly. this as crazy as that exactly. is. I know, I know, I totally know what you mean. I but, totally know. but yeah, that quiet time away from the world does help you integrate it a lot deeper, I think. Yes, absolutely. And I, and part of that is what we really want to um help you to take away you know from the wet, wet, uh, from the workshop so that you do understand how to create that space and what is needed you know um, and it doesn't need to be this whole drawn out uh, thing but there are little things you can do every day to give yourself that time so it's gonna be incredible um, that is definitely one thing I will say um, where I, I think you're, you're you picked that up in me because it is real. There, there was a lot of work um, that went on, and I don't want anyone to think I, I popped out of heaven and was like, <laughs> like it was not like that at all. Um, but I've, I've uh, not only spent all those years with the soul work, but then becoming an influencer online and being so vocal in front of the world and learning how to share my story and and integrate back in the world so publicly I think has allowed me to get to this point today where I'm able to communicate it better you a know lot of, a lot of people fear being public like that people come up to me and say oh you're just out there and I'm like oh yeah yeah I'm just yeah. out there and I asked I never even asked my community college um, dean and, and president what they thought of it and they're like oh, yeah, really? we, we know you're weird now but ah! you're, you're our weird <laughs> right oh, <really? laughs> So, you know, I just, you just do it and people accept you. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. It's like that, that's, that's what I would love for more people to understand. It's just making that jump and then they'll be fine. You may have a few people say something up front, but the majority of the people are going to want to know more. Yes. So, yes. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it has been amazing talking with you and I can't wait to be yeah. in your workshop and hang out yeah. with you in Austin. But yes. <laughs> Absolutely. This has been a pleasure. I love chatting with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And for those of you watching, please subscribe to my channel and I will put all of the information about Austin and your website and we will stay in touch. But Thank you very much.